Hello and welcome back to the Front 3 show with the Sports Bowl. As always, I'm your host, Peepo. Hello. With me is the Prince of Rome, Jake McGill. Say hello, Jake. Hello, everybody. And coming on your screens in about a second is Mr. Tall Brenton Hagen. Hello, Brenton. Hello. Uh, nope. uh, we've had a little bit of technical difficulties that are setting up tonight. Uh, we've also moved location. We're in the Prince's Palatial Suites um, tonight because I moved house and we haven't everything uh, set up, so we decided to go on the road. And um, we've stopped off at Jake's house. Sports Bible Tour. Sports Bible Tour. <clears throat> Plenty to talk about tonight, lads, because there's been um, some some football on during the week there. Also, Arsenal, just fresh off, a very impressive performance in Milan, winning 2 0. Excellent, absolutely delighted with that, given the amount of, I suppose, back pages that Arsenal have taken up for the wrong reasons over the past few weeks. You know, it's great to see that tomorrow morning they'll actually be on the back pages for a, a very convincing 2 0 win away at the San Siro, which is never. An easy place to go. No, so I'll, very I'll pack nice. San Siro as well. Look, yes. it was full, Big crowd. full house. Um, yes, in good form too. Really, really good mean? form. The form team. Uh, well, Na- Napoli and Juventus have done well. I think over the t- t- last ten game game period, I guess they've been right up there. <coughs> Pardon me, with the form team in in Serie A. So a massive result for Arsenal away from home. Um, as we said tonight, we have plenty to talk about. Uh, when we talk about Paolo, Bruno, Ezekiel, Dybala. Um, I and remember. The, and the game last night. And we'll be talking about Michael O'Neill's comments during the week there. <coughs> and also look ahead to Liverpool versus Manchester United uh, on Saturday at Old Trafford. Will we start with Champions League? Yeah, we'll start with Chelsea. Um, did you. And well, you should, actually both of you should have enjoyed last night because Spurs lost the game of football. But what did you think of the game? I'll, I'll go to you first, Brenton. As a whole, like, what did you make of it? As a whole, you probably have to look over, over the two legs. And we were talking earlier, <coughs> a lot of people were coming out and saying that Juventus only played well for 15 minutes in the yeah. whole of the two legs. And that's nonsense, pretty much. If you remember back before Spurs did dominate uh, most, of the, um, most of the game in the first leg. But before that, Juventus were clinical. They went 2-0 up. They and they should have probably just gone 3-0 up as well. Like Gonzalo Higuain missed a massive chance. Yeah. And um, there were other chances early, in that. and then Spurs did turn it on. Spurs were very impressive in the second half in Turin. Um, and then they continued that into the first half of, of, of the second leg last night. But Juventus um, wants the switch formation, and that was the key turning point. You could actually see it. Very rarely have I seen such an impact from a, a tactical change. Um, on the pitch so clearly and Tottenham didn't react to it quick enough anyway <coughs> Juventus were, like Lex Steiner was such um, he was a general he came on and he was like a general for an army or something wasn't he he just took over he controlled that game as soon as he came on yeah um, you have to give credit to, to Allegri. Allegri and, and Juventus you know for First of all, recognising it and then doing something about it for a start, but doing the right thing about it. Yeah. And I suppose the one thing that I did notice following the, the commentary on the game last night is that they were criticising um, the ability of a very experienced Juventus team to adapt to a very young and vibrant Tottenham team. But ultimately, at the end, it was the experience that enabled that Juventus team to adapt tactically, which ensured that they went through to the to the quarterfinals. And that experience is not something that can be bought. Um, it was absolutely marvelous to see, you know, and it's a real notable point that I would agree with you on, Brendan. Mm. Actually, I thought um, just as you were, the substitution was interesting. Like, <clears throat> usually, when we see a game change with substitute, it's when someone's brought on, mm. and the player in the, as an individual performance where he scores a goal or he sets up a goal. Whereas Allegri's substitutions, and he made, he made, he didn't make like the two of them. I know he brought on Gerard as well. But he didn't bring on Asamoah and Liechtenstein at the same time. He brought, the, he broke it up and he brought them on at separate times. So Spurs didn't really get a chance to see what was going on. But it wasn't like an individual. Come on, as I said, like he didn't bring on like something Mo Salah or uh, Hazard, and, and they changed the game. You, you brought on, you changed the shape. The players he brought on weren't exactly your game winners like Liechtenstein or. What do you call him? Like like Steiner's Steiner. not known as a game winner, not certainly not. But and we look at the bench. People were talking about. Well, there's not much in that bench for you. I looked at it last night at half time, thinking like, where are they going to get something from here? And that's where Allegri, and Allegri probably of all the managers that are of top teams in Europe, he probably gets polarized 
some of the most for his tactical nice. Zidane sort of has seen as well he has Ronaldo and all that mm-hmm. there. Crack is just like Luis Enrique. But and Mourinho gets he's sort of Mr. Negative or whatever and Klopp mm-hmm. gets laughed at because he can't defend. But Allegri's constantly picked up because he is sort of like he doesn't really know what he's doing, like about such a thing. But last night he showed that that he is really is a world class mm-hmm. tactician like and I thought it was brilliant. Yeah. On the other hand, <clears throat> Pochettino has got a lot of praise this season, but I don't think he he didn't react at all. He didn't react, but also he didn't foresee this coming. And in this stage of the Champions League, it's the best competition in the world. Like, and I said to you, um, you know, you can feel it. You can feel as a as a fan or just as a spectator or anything, even if you're neutral, you can feel something coming in the Champions League because yeah. it's such high stakes and the players are of such a quality that, like, this is what you've had want. Like, this is. This is what they're striving towards. Think of John Luigi Buffon. You know, this is his last season, and he hasn't won the Champions League, and all this comes into it. Heart, and you saw the way Chiellini and him celebrated, clearing the ball. Do you know what I mean? Putting it's, the ball for a corner, and they're going mad as if they won the game. Yeah, you know, it's, and Pochettino couldn't see. I don't think that you know, even though Erickson's been very good this season, Dali Ali not so much this this season, but last season, these players last night weren't having an impact on the game. Especially mm. Erickson was a passenger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, why not? So is Dembele, who was hailed as I yeah. think he was compared to Ronaldinho. I don't know what other players he was compared to. You know, he had one good, great game, and he's a solid player. But you know, he was he played as he usually does last night, and he just wasn't. He, he had two great. surging runs where it looked like Cadero was really going to struggle with him mm. again last night, and then well, I didn't notice it at the time. Maybe if I watch it back, there might have been a technical change. Something did change in that midfield for Juventus, even in the first half. I know at the back they were a bit open. Why they decided to leave Bizarrely against Son on his own, I don't I never know, but <clears throat> pardon me. Something must have changed in that midfield because that midfield all of a sudden got a hold of the likes of Ericsson and Dembele and it was more like it was either it was the Son show for the first half. He was superb for the yeah. first half. But yeah, he, he wasn't himself last night, Dembele, but like Paolo Dybala <laughs> Like, Gonzalo Higuain gets called the biggest bottler because he misses penalties. I know he missed penalties in the World Cup. Um, was the World Cup he missed a penalty or something? Or he definitely missed one against... Um, he missed what about the World Cup? And he, he missed key ones before and all. And he's sort of seen as this bottler at those, in different, certain situations. But last night he stepped up when he needed to. And then Dybala's finish. Like you were talking about before we came on, Jake. Mm-hmm. It was just... Sublime. <sighs> you know? But even Higuain, just to, to make that point, like... I don't think people give him the credit he deserves at times. No. Even, even though you think, okay, it was, it was great ball and it was flick on, but he re, he's reacting now, he's in the right place to finish. Do you know what I mean? And that's, that's, that's harder where, than you think it is. That's from a striker who had fed on scraps the, for almost the entirety of the match, but he remained hungry to get that decisive goal. And it's and the goal. He switched on, Matt. Exactly. Like and, it was, and it was his ability to adapt to a ball that was thrown into the box by Licksteiner, um, header came on and he adapted and it was in the net before Lloris could move. You know, he adapted and right there, didn't he? Exactly. And that's the, that's the speed of mind and the agility that Higuain has and he's not always given the credit for it. He's very rarely actually given the credit for that. Mm-hmm. And I suppose you compare that with a team who maximised the, the, the chances that they had with a team in Tottenham who created by far more opportunities, 23 in fact, six of them were on target. So it was actually Tottenham who were shot shy. Um, <clears throat> stop, man. I'm gonna ask you both two questions, um, and he's gonna answer me, and I'll give my answer as well. And anyone at home watching, either live or later, let me know your thoughts on this. The first one is, um, if you had a choice, and you're a manager of a football team, and don't worry about money or anything like that, don't even worry about playing styles. Just think on the player, Dybala or Griezmann. Who would you rather buy? Who would you rather have? Both. <laughs> No, you can't choose both. It is hard, but I, I, I think I would go to Bala. Why? I knew that was coming. Um, I think he's slightly more robust. He's slightly more sort of adaptable. I think Griezmann's not light, but you, you know what I'm getting at. He, he's one-dimensional in a sense. Um, I just think, and also Dybala constantly um, shows up, you know, he constantly gets the goals, he gets the performances, he's, he's their 
go to a man now, you know. Um, out for a month, he comes back against Lazio in a big game and scores a winner. Brilliant goal too. Out of, um, <clears throat> you know, didn't play in the first leg against Spurs, comes in second leg. And yes, he, he didn't take a game by the scruff of the neck, but he got the important goal and that is what you need your big players for. Like. He also, I also noticed, <clears throat> I will let the answer take in a minute, I also noticed as well that when they did go 2-1 up, he, he sort of became a bit of a leader too. You could see him, he was telling people where to go and he was dropping into the midfield position. Like the Juventus were obviously just simply, as soon as they went 2-1 up, the game was won. Yeah. It was so un, it was unreal watching every single Juventus player, not because they'd just gone 2-1 up in the game, but just thought, you're not going to score here today, Tottenham. You just seen them lift and they're all so tactically astute. It was, he was one of those. Like, and Dybala... He is, people might think of him as a goal scorer, but he he is maybe, Messi obviously wears number 10 in his back, so that blows all out of the way, but he's maybe, behind Messi, maybe the best 10 in the world of football. I know Coutinho at Liverpool was good and stuff, but something about Dybala, he just, like, he just has that little bit more. I would pick Dybala. And so, well, <coughs> still relatively young, yeah. Gentlemen, you've convinced me. <laughs> and I suppose the thing that convinced me there, you talked about the strength of Dybala and his ability to mix it. I remember one, uh, on one occasion last night on the wing, he had the tricks of the trade to get by um, a Tottenham defender and to win a free kick, legitimately. And not only does he have those tricks of the trade that a lot of players do have, but he had that ice cool, I suppose, confidence, assurance that he was going to finish Tottenham off last night and that's what he did. You so know, he got a sniff like not play. not too many players <clears throat> can have the balance of both of those things. Yeah. He can mix it and he can also score the key goals. And especially when you say, you know, um he scored that key goal but he'd a lot of time to think about that and, yes. and sometimes you think you think, oh he's a lot of time to think about like it, it's a positive thing, but that can be negative. You run through all these situations in your head and you might think, where am I going to put it, right, left, or whatever, and then you miscontrol the ball, or you let it run away from you, or the fender catches up on you, but he was ice cool. Yeah. He did everything <coughs> right, and made it look so easy. Right. You knew going through, it's the ball. Like, it's yeah. Work, like, do you know what I mean? And, and even now, like, uh, Mo Salah has been absolutely unbelievable for us. I was still, if that was Mo Salah, I still think, mm, there's a chance he might, he might put this wide. Yeah. Whereas you knew straight away the ball was not missing that. Um, the second question, and um, just, just before, hello Sean, Sean wants to know what the curtains are there for Arsenal, take are these the Arsenal curtains? The day actually... Every, um, everything in this house is Arsenal inspired and Arsenal and infused, you know? How's your answer, even Sean? The, even the mugs. Even the mugs. And the mug right beside me. I'll see you on Saturday morning, by the way, Sean, thanks. Um, my second question, and Spurs fans, please get involved here as well. Are, are Spurs butlers? Is this Spurs team... Is it that they're just still very immature, football-wise, or is there is there something there mentally? Is there a, a weakness there that... Um, <clears throat> I was thinking about this, you know, after that game, and I think it might be... Uh, I, don't, I wouldn't say bottlers, I just think there's a, a naivety there in terms of not... I don't know if it's not knowing how to defend the lead, but wanting to always score more and wanting to always mm. be flamboyant and, and win by two or three rather than win one nil and get through. Mm. Remember, like they have, pe I think they have periods in games where they can blow anybody out of the water. They did that against Juventus, they did it against Real Madrid, and the did it against Liverpool. That Wembley, the blessed us, but. Man. Against Liverpool, they also had that period where Liverpool blitzed them. Oh, the Anfield game? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. then Spurs came, came back into it and, and yeah, did what they've been doing for most of the season. But they have patches where they're sh like, they're so, they look so vulnerable. And the players at the back who, um, you know, they've been in a lot of people's teams of the season so far and, on and all the rest of it. But Dyer and Vertonghen and... Um, Sanchez. Sanchez, especially at times, think I think looks as if he's out of his depth. He's, you know, um, that 15, 20 minute period that Juventus, it was less than that actually, it was maybe 10 minutes where they were properly going at Spurs. Spurs look, you know, yeah. they could see more. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where some of the other top European clubs, if they go like Juventus did, if they go a goal up, shut up shop, 
and we need to get through the next round. They recognise when you can go and be flamboyant and go and score another two or three goals, but in games like that, you need to, especially where I think the change need to be made, bring on Erickson, or bring off Erickson, bring off Dali Ali, bring on Winyama and go, you know, keep Lee Kane up front by himself. You don't need to score another two goals. But Brendan, I suppose that back to the question that Philip asked there, are they bottlers? I wouldn't say they're bottlers, but I would say they're inexperienced in big matches. Mm. You know, um, a club that really holds uh, the North London Derby is the only big match that they've played in recent years. It's not a club that has much experience, you know, and that's where they're going to get caught out during these years, in the, their infancy years under uh, uh, Maurizio Pochettino in the Champions League. But if they get back into it next year, they'll grow and they'll learn from that, and that's the key thing. Yeah, yeah I. As I, long as they keep Harry Kane. <clears throat> you know. I think they'll keep Harry Kane. I don't think Harry Kane will, will, will ask to leave, and I, I really don't see. Daniel Levy selling him unless it's a, uh, I mean an absolute stupid amount of money he's offered because well, they'll need him to grow again and they're spending so much money in this stadium I, I don't think they're bottlers but um, I can see why people are saying that about them and I do think tactically they can be very very naive like the, and they're oh, alright the group stages they beat Real Madrid and Dortmund but it's a completely different pressure in the oh. group stages than when you're playing the knockout stages and like last night it was in the 76th minute and it made me chuckle, I to chop the notes, couldn't stop laughing. Um, Juventus must have kept the ball for about four minutes and it bounces back to Brazagli, who's the old he's thirty seven, the old man of the team. He looks like a wardrobe. Uh, he, looks like, he looks like he'd have a touch of a wardrobe as well. And he pings his ball, it loops right out over about 50, 40 yards, right over to Asimov, chops his feet, and they ping it back. There's no Spurs player within twenty yards, and Spurs you could feel from T V. I know Spurs don't want to get chances not, but sort of feel in T V Spurs are like, I oh, no, we're in our depth here like and there was so much confidence in Juve. But I haven't seen Spurs do that. But the problem was... In any game that they've been tight, that, mm. do you know what I mean? The, where the, the yeah. is gone. Like, look what happened when they were... Sorry, Tom, they were 2-0 up against Chelsea when they were going to win the league with Leicester. Mm. Just completely threw their... As soon as one goal went in, just, everything just fell out. And I think if you rough Spurs up, which Juventus did last night as well, and Chelsea definitely did it that night at the yeah, bridge. Yeah, yeah. Battle at the bridge. Mm -hmm. um, you can get them going then. Like, they're, um, they're so reactive. You know... They're, but that's a game in experience, yeah. you know. But how many times is that going to happen in big games where they need to sort of realise, okay, they're trying to do this to us, let's just step back a few and let them have the ball. So but, I suppose so long as their sole focus is to finish as the top North London club, because they need to get out of that narrow-mindedness. Well, Spurs fans, let us know what you think of Jake's comments there. Uh, I will say, I'll finish it off with someone summed it up on Twitter. I forget who it was, um, so if you're watching this, sorry, but... They said it was like a, a young boxer via an old, a very old boxer and how the young boxer started off very quickly the rounds but blew himself out and the old boxer was able to pick him off towards the end. So that sort of summed it up right because that's how I even played it because <laughs> yeah. they are on the ropes at some point but that's our Spurs and Champions League chat. And <clears throat> an old lady boxer <laughs> yeah, on yeah. International <laughs> Women's Day. Oh yes! Hard 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 hard. all the women, up, up all the mas, daughters and sisters and girlfriends and friends and all that crack. Yeah, but not too much. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you're going to get us troll, Jake. So that's a Champions League round up. Liverpool went through as well, uh, nil nil with uh, Porto. Big Dave was there. Uh, I think he enjoyed himself in the crowd and didn't really pay much to the match, to be honest. But um, PSG did a PSG and went out to Real Madrid. And Man City were beat by Basel, and now, but they're still through, so doesn't it doesn't really matter. Interesting. Um, well, I'll just have to pick a new winner. You'll have to pick a new winner. Uh, <laughs> PSG. <laughs> Uh, you pick Liverpool and I pick Man City, so we're still going strong there. We're still going strong until they meet in the quarterfinals. <laughs> Final. Our second topic of the night is one that actually isn't football for a change, uh, but is related to football. Um, Michael O'Neill did an interview with the Irish Daily Mail at the weekend. It, it first came out on, on Monday from MS, MSN, wasn't it, in America? Uh, and I think some of the quotes in that were wrong, so it was taken down. But it's come up again since where Michael O'Neill has come out and he's had a go about the FAI poaching players from the IFA. Everybody knows it happened, everybody knows what's going on, we're all aware of it. But he came out and he said that um, what the FAI are doing, obviously they did it wrong and they only go after Catholics mm -hmm. uh, that play in the North. Um, which uh, we'll talk about in a minute. I personally think, and we'll get more into it, I think uh, was a wrong of him to do that and we're going to talk find out, find out what the two lads think what do you think 
What, I'll go with you, Jake, because I know you want to talk about it. Look, I think it's a totally inappropriate comment from a manager of a team, a team that represent a country which has seen so much conflict, conflict that has been misattributed to religion. And for him to bring religion into the debate, I think, is totally inappropriate. Um, and also, uh, I suppose, an insight into how unlearned um, Michael O'Neill is. I, I think it was really inappropriate. I think um, it, was, it was stupid of him, actually, to, to say that. Just I, I, I totally, I like you speak a minute, Brent, I totally understand why he gets annoyed. Um, I've been been involved seeing the first time what goes on at IFA, IFA development centres now at IFA are doing a really unbelievable job at the coaching level and trying to bring players through at grassroots. They've really started to pump money into it. There's some fantastic coaches um, and they get annoyed then and rightly so if you train someone for four or five years, put so much money into him or her um, and resources and then they just decide to jump ship and go to another nation to play for them. I totally get that, that shouldn't happen. Maybe there's something needs to be brought in where if from 14 years on or something, you cannot do that. But I think Michael O'Neill's comments just, they were just not what we need. And just at a moment, sorry, just to come <coughs> before Brendan there, but just at a time <coughs> when Northern Ireland was starting to represent what people would refer to as different aspects of the community in Northern Ireland, when other aspects of other parts of the community that previously could not have identified with the Northern Ireland um, international team were starting to identify with them. And this brings into the, 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 the world of sport something that is totally unnecessary. Yeah. For, uh, first of all, I think it's, it's important to say that it is a very, very unique situation we're in here oh, as, as this right. country. And you can see where the frustration comes from, as you're saying, resources are put into certain <coughs> players that they want to develop and, and who they see the talent in, and then another country comes in and from their aspect pinches that player. This is what he's, he's saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's a way to go about certain things, and whether you like it or not, it's different in this country. To, to say that was you know Spain, France, or whatever it is, it's different here because. He knew by making those comments what he's going to get a reaction. Effect, he knew he was what, going to get a what effect that was going to have on on fans from both sides, and it's always going to go the same way where they're going to say, "Oh well, obviously that's true. They're just pinching all of our players, them and down there." Do you know that yeah. that's just that's just <laughs> what is going to happen, and I hate it. And I think a lot of people are probably getting sick of it, but there are still that core group of people who are going to identify what with said. what he says and exploit it. Yeah. yeah. So I think it was it was wrong when he said it was silly. It was, I didn't expect it from him. I, no, I, um, I was anno I'm just annoyed at him for it because I hold Mike Lundy. You know this, I said yeah. it shows in such high esteem as a coach and what he's done for Northern Ireland football and like some of my best mates have had the best two weeks of their lives following him in France and following him all over the place and they're con every time you mention it to them, you can see them beaming because it's just been brilliant. Mm -hmm. And then him do that sort of just be like, Michael, like, why? Like, <laughs> do you know? It'd be really interesting <clears throat> to see what people think of that. You know, what, what you think of. Please. Yeah. Um, but just, was there a better way around it? Um, I think there was. You know, all that needs to be done behind closed doors. Yeah. We don't know if it's the first time it's been brought up between the two or... It, you know, well, I think it's the first time that he's actually it's been said that you know Republic of Ireland target one type of player Catholic. You know that is completely ludicrous. And you know, Mark Michael o Michael O'Neill has been criticised by Martin O'Neill today naturally, and um, Martin would want to keep the better players naturally. But look at the squad that Martin has named: thirty players for the Turkey international at the end of the month. Three of those thirty are from Northern Ireland. That's 10%. 40% of those players in that squad are from England. So surely it's Gareth, it's Gareth Southgate who should have a problem with the Republic of Ireland's tactic in um, tapping up talent. Not Northern Ireland. The Michael O'Neill, Dan McDonald did a brilliant 
uh, my opinion, piece on the, in the Irish Independent where he talked about it and I think he nailed it where he said Michael O'Neill's issue shouldn't necessarily just be with the FAI, it actually should be with the FIFA ruling. Mm. And like, what does he expect? If it is true that the FAI were inquiring about Paddy McNair and then realised that Paddy McNair was from a Protestant background and then decided we'll back off and chase him. Like, what did the next, the FAI aren't going to chase a Protestant from the North because they know like 99.9% of .9 times out of 100 that they're, they're going to say no, I want to represent Northern Ireland, which is totally 100%. Like, but, you know, there's no but, issues with that. But, but I, Philip, you know, that's something that I would totally disagree with. Not what you're saying there, but the, the argument that comes from that then is sort of to say, are there no Protestants that play for the Republic of Ireland? That is complete nonsense. No, uh, yeah, obviously it is, but maybe you know, but once you, you wouldn't like, see any from. Would you see many from the north? That's probably why the FAA backed off. And that's Mal McGinn's an obvious example. What? Of a Catholic that plays for Northern Ireland. Oh yeah, but what I mean, would you see like a Protestant from the north play for the Republic? That's you know that's what I'm getting at. Protestant from the north play for the Republic. How about... It's unlikely. That's why... How I'm, about someone who actually doesn't really care about religion? That, yeah, but which the majority that's why the FBI, don't. That's why the FBI supposedly backed off. Mm. But surely Mike Money can understand why they then backed off because they thought, well, we're going to have no chance of getting mm. him. Perhaps. Uh, but I think it, it but is... But you'd like to think that it's more about a player's desire to play for a particular team rather than saying, OK, I'm going to be going down here to play in a squad of 30. 29 of them are Catholics now, only have one Protestant mate. Like... Is that really yeah, what no, they're thinking? That's, that's, that's not you know, really Also, when you think about it, purely tech, religion out of tech, um, you know, nationalists, all the rest out of it, it should be about the football too. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the fact really should be players or, or teams, say you look at, at, at the Republic and Northern Ireland as uh, club teams. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they're going to go after the best players that they can possibly get. That's the whole point. Mm -hmm. To improve your team, not to say, haha, we got that Catholic from up north. No, so no, it's, no, 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 it's for the football and reason that they go after the player. Yeah. Whether they're Catholic or Protestant. Now, Philip's point is right in the sense that there probably would be less likely to approach a player who comes from, and I'm going to get away from, from, from the, the religious language, but from a unionist area. Yeah, yeah, They'll yeah. be unlikely to approach yeah. a player from that area. But even not because he's from, from a unionist area, just because... He's, he's probably not going to play for them. Yes, he wants, he's wants yes. to play for probably it's like saying, Yes, that's right. It's like saying, it's like the Liverpool scouts going into Liverpool and saying, he's got a strong Everton background. There's no chance we're going to get him. Jimmy so let's Carter. go here. Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah, it's, it, it's unlikely. Yeah. Throw away, but, but it can have an impact. But yeah. it's also unhelpful for the manager to come out and say it into the public domain. I think. It's just, because we've got a, we're in a good place now. Yes. You know, it's sort of, everything seems to be going okay and, both teams are doing relatively well. I know they're, they're unlucky with, um, well, Northern Ireland were unlucky. They were very close. The Denmark game was one that everyone probably didn't want to talk about, but the Northern Ireland were unlucky and that penalty should never happened. Uh, but they're both in good places in terms of football-wise and they've done quite well and they've got a, they're going to have a World Cup qualif or Euro qualifier coming up and then they've agreed to have a friendly mm -hmm. and then this comes out and you just think, like, what? Why? Like, and also, Michael O'Neill <coughs> is a Northern Ireland manager and he should be doing everything that's part to make Northern Ireland a positive team yeah. and to help them out in terms of you know relationships, players, football and all everything all combined. How has this helped Northern Ireland? It hasn't really. No. It's not going to like, at all. And that's where I question What's behind that? Why did he not? If he really felt strongly about it, why did he not go down to the FA? I sat up a meeting. What I could have been done behind closed doors, and he wouldn't. Because he's given political morons. Fuel to the fire. Exactly. You know. Exactly. <clears throat> For sure. Eamon's made a really good point. Um, is it a religion issue? What's wrong with players having to choose which team to play for at an underage level, having to stay with that team? The player still has the choice, but only once. I 110% Eamon, I'm not just saying that because you're his uncle, back that to a T. I think that's what should happen. You play for a nation, a nation once, that's it, that's who you play for. If you don't want to play for them anymore, you don't play international football anymore. If you're not good enough for them and think you'll jump to someone else that's maybe not as strong, you get a position, no, you can't, tough. You, you make that choice and that's it. 
Done, dusted. That's a wider issue. That's a FIFA issue. That's yeah, just... that, that needs to be FIFA set in. But until that's Sad, but, age... but remember, back to your point, we're in a very unique position. Also, religion issue, certainly not. Catholics and Protestants are both Christian, so it shouldn't really be a religion issue at all. Yeah. But, um, you know, we are in a unique situation here. The Good Friday Agreement, um, agreements, um, you know, dual nationality, it is okay, but yeah. dual nationality is an option for people in this part of the world, and we need to, you know, cherish that, really. Oh no, but if they play, uh, yeah, to a point, but there needs to be a rule then brought in where if you, if I play for Northern Ireland, I can't turn around, if, if I have a son, right, Unless or a daughter, and they're quite good at football, and they play for Northern Ireland, I don't raise that, well, they can't then turn around and say, right, Daddy, I want to go play for Republic of Ireland, mm -hmm. I wouldn't let that happen if that does happen, just future little ones, um, they can't turn around and do that, I don't, I don't think it's right, like, I, I really don't, because I see, and that's only me coming from a little bit of a bias to, towards the IFA background, because of, I know coaches that have been involved and have been involved and helped out a little bit and I see what's going in and amount of effort going into and I think that needs to be stopped. But Just to, to bring it back to <coughs> football and matters, right? Yeah. Uh, Michael O'Neill said that he could name 10 players off the top of his head currently who should be playing for Northern Ireland, right? Mm -hmm. Now, um, in the current, roughly, I can find five maybe that he's talking about here. Um, Shane Duffy, would he get into the Northern Ireland team? Without a doubt. Okay, fair enough. McLean? Uh, well, we'll probably get shared off for this, but I, I would pick him for Northern Ireland if you, if you play for Northern Ireland because I think he'd probably offer more than... I don't think the majority of people would want him to play. But no, if you take away all that there and just think of football, he probably would get in and, instead of someone on one of the wings. You know Kane? No. 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 Mark Wilson? No. 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 Not a chance. Darren Gibson? No. 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 So, realistically here, we're talking about two players currently out there. So it's not an issue. Maybe, you know, maybe maybe, yeah. maybe. maybe. But, but they had the choice and they didn't choose that option. So yeah, they have the choice. Come on, Michael, choose your words better. Um, yeah, and hopefully it'll all get sorted out, and the two managers will just do um their talking on the pitch, so to speak, and we'll see better results, better nights at Windsor Park, and better nights down Lansdowne Road. I refuse to call it a view. I don't like calling it a view. Um, also, what about Northern Ireland? Just throwing it out there. Oh God, he said. That's my fault. But we did, we did for for last week's video, which we had a, for last week's show, which we had to cancel because of the snow. Um, you know, we did put out there the whole north south, um, eleven. What about doing that for Ireland? You know, it's something we might think about for next <laughs> we, week. We could do it, and we'll see what happens. Um, T J Donnelly, the teach fella. What we're going to talk about this night? What's going to happen? Uh, on Sunday, I think he might mean what's going to happen on Saturday. Saturday. Um, I was quite bad as well. I thought it was Sunday until uh, this morning. So Saturday at Old Trafford, Liverpool head off to play Manchester United. Mm. Uh, as a Liverpool fan, this is obviously like a, like a big game for us. It's massive and uh, whatever. You love to win at Old Trafford when, if it does happen, when it does happen. But it's strange this year because we're absolutely miles away from from Man City. Mm -hmm. So we're fighting both teams. Both teams, yeah. So we're fighting to get top four. And we're fighting to um, get second place, and it's not really what I want Liverpool to do. It's not really a thing, is it? Like it's not really a thing. Like it's we made into a thing. I'm, I'm, more, I'm more focused on the Champions League, and I'm sure the United fans are the same. Like they're more worried about you know, how far they can go in Europe this year, and the FA Cup compared to what how they can do in the league now. But it'll still be a big game. It's Liverpool, Manchester United, Old Trafford. How do you think? What way do you think you see it go on? And what I'll let you go first, man. You go first last time. Um, it's one of those where I don't say this before, we say all the time, form goes out the window, kind of. Liverpool are in really good form. United, not so much, although they come off the back of a great win at Crystal Palace um, after they looked completely down and out and awful in the first half. Shocking. The Pogba was terrible. I only. Um, Looked at the highlights, but um, he, he looked like he was the worst player on the pitch. He, all of them were dreadful. Um, and it, uh, is um, he went for a, a Hollywood ball over the top, which actually eventually led to Crystal Palace's first goal. Um, it's, it's almost like he's trying to prove himself too much, or you know, I can do this. I'm Paul Pogba, you know, just do it simple. But you know, when he does it simple and he glides past players, and that's when he's at his best. Um, but. <laughs> I don't know why, but I could see United 
getting something out of the game. It's at Old Trafford, um, which obviously is um, favour of United. Mourinho loves these games. He loves the challenge of it, I think. Mm -hmm. um, always at Chelsea, you, you, when Mourinho was there, you felt like you had an added advantage because he, he's done it in so many big games and he's pulled it off in so many big games. Um, I don't know how they're going to do it, that's the only thing. Um, Liverpool's attack is on paper so much better than United's defence. It's important to think if United get Eric Bailly back in, mm -hmm. um, because he's a fantastic player, and Smalling and Jones or whoever's at the heart of that defence aren't the same without Bailly on the right hand side there. And I can just see United scoring early or scoring first and, and sitting back in and absorbing it up and frustrating Liverpool. Um, but I don't know. It's, it's very hard to call. Like, it, it's going to be tight. What do you think? But I think United. It's going to be tight. Um, certainly it's going to be... Look, I am in no doubt that Liverpool will win this game. Look, I... I know United came back well against Crystal Palace, but their defence was absolutely shocking. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be as bad tomorrow, but ultimately the clientele aren't going to really change apart from Bay. But the damage will be done in the wide areas. Valencia and Young are not good enough to play a wing back, and they'll be ripped to pieces. And look, I still hold Liverpool as a favourite to the Champions League because I know how good their attack is. Over two legs, it's a different story. This is a one off game at Old Trafford, of course, United have a chance, but it'll be. Points dropped if Liverpool don't take the victory. I am. Um, <clears throat> I'm confident we'll win on Saturday. Confident? You'll yeah, win I think we'll win. As, as, like I just. When was the last time you said that? Uh, when Moisey was in charge. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, yeah, and we won three 0 uh, the year we we, uh, we didn't win the league. Um, I I quite like I'm quite, I'm not even quite like, I'm confident that I think we'll win on Saturday. It's not it's not just a Liverpool. Oh, we hate my United thing. I just think that we're in that rich vein of form at the minute, and our front three every time you watch them, even if we're not having totally that good a game, the three the three of them will do something and you're just like oh, oh hang on okay they, they make a difference, and even Oxley Chamberlain the other day was brilliant against Newcastle and he helped and yeah I, I just I just think under Klopp and I think the the way we're in at the minute and the momentum and the way we've been going and kicking on I can see us I can see us winning on Sunday on Saturday I don't think we'll win by. A bucket load, I think it'll be like a 2-1 or a 2-0 two, two um, I'll go with, and I, I think we'll win on Saturday, yeah. I, did, I, I watched United the other night, um, and I, 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 like obviously it's hard to be a neutral when they're your biggest rivals, them and Everton, and you, you, you're watching them, but I watched them the night, I was trying to be as neutral as possible to see the, and analyse and think about what they're doing and try and be positive about it and everything, and the first half was atrocious. And <clears throat> they just looked nil and void of, that's the right term, of anything creative. Sanchez didn't look right. Pogba, as you said, looked off. Um, even Lingard wasn't doing what Lingard's been doing. You know, he didn't even look like he was going to get a sniff of a chance. And then when they got back into it, it was Manchester United that we knew under Fergie that never gave up and came back. Crystal Palace did tire, yes, granted. Manchester United kept going and they got that brilliant goal from Maric. Mm. But I still, even though they came back and won it, it was brilliant for them and it was a big boost. I still, when I came well, driving home thinking about the game, I was thinking, no, there's that United team can be well got at, like at the minute. They just I don't, think, don't, they're not Manchester United that we're used to. I think Liverpool will them. exploit them. And I think Chelsea actually dropped points. Chelsea, uh, well, sorry, I was tripped up there. Chelsea had an opportunity when they went there to really have a go at this United team and didn't. They, they went 1 0 up and then. Second half backed off and whatever happened. I think yeah. Chelsea let that go. Personally. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. United didn't prove in the second half at Old Trafford yes. definitely, but Chelsea. There's so much. Felt like they were happy so enough. Yeah. True. There's so much in this United team. True, like, but just... Liverpool could have this game over in the first half. That's the sort, That's how good they are. And you know, I'm, I'm not trying to big Liverpool up here for some sort of fall. You know, I really think they're the second best and team in the, in the Premier League, and they're the closest to challenging City. Not this year. No, Not a chance. Is. But I mean, they're the closest team, collectively, with a plan to challenging Manchester City. What do you see? I, I have a real feeling on Saturday that 
You know Mourinho. They know. Yeah. They know that. They know Liverpool are going to fly out of the blocks. They always do. They don't really play any other way. Liverpool. Mm-hmm. Mourinho will set that up so that they are. Oh, we try and lay traps. We, Liverpool will. Have, they're one hundred percent right. There is a. There is all, and it's a game of football. There's always a chance. Like, but he will set traps, and players like Lingard and Sanchez could get a trap, and that could be it. But Liverpool, I think we switched on. And I, I just I'm confident that we'll do it. Looking forward to it. Yeah, Looking for an interesting show next week. Yeah, look, Liverpool have lost plenty of times before and have been on this. It's, it's actually one of the reasons why I love doing it because it's quite therapeutic. But um, yes, everyone, thanks for joining in. Thanks for watching live. Okay. And if you're watching um, later, also, Roisin, yes, up all the fiancés. They're the best, yes. especially mine. Um, we're going to have a Just Jake coming out. Just Jake's going to get another show done over the weekend. I'll have a Babble chat maybe on Sunday. I am coming out maybe on Monday. Um, just to finally note, just to say on this International Day of, of Women, to pay tribute to the excellent um, performances of England under Phil Neville. Yeah, they did do well. They did in America, well. They did so well. fair play to them. You know, in it's the, great. To, it's she great. believes cup in the Yes, that's right. Cup. And it's great to see you know women football, women football, ladies football, be given such a platform. So yes, that's brilliant. And um, also keep going on our competition. We're almost at the five hundred likes now, and then we'll be buying one of these lucky people a brand new Premier League top for the year. So thanks for joining in. Catch us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter at the Sports Babble. Tell all your mates. See you later. <laughs>